I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. I have not seen today's guests in over 10 years. Well, she lives in Germany now, so that's part of the reason. The last time I saw her, we were both speaking in an event in Thousand Oaks when her book, why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows had just come out. And she has since authored many other books and she signed it for me, which I always appreciate. And she's going to talk a little bit about those new books and just this whole topic of carnism. Please welcome all the way from Germany, Dr. Melanie Joy. Like I say, time has been very kind to you. You look exactly the same as I remember you 10 years ago. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And you look amazing. And of course, plant-based eating is, you know, kind to all of us, our bodies and, um, you know, and beyond. I think that's true because, you know, people say, oh, it's just genetics. And I have relatives that don't eat like me and, and I'm not bragging, but, but I think, mm -hmm. I think how, how we eat and how we age, they, they do go together for a lot of people. It certainly helps. It, and it couldn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait to, to start. What, what have you been up to for the last 10 years other than winning awards and traveling uh, to like 30 <laughs> countries to speak on this? Uh, that award that you won, I've never even heard. Like I won the, um, I won a, what's it called? The Vegan Hall of Fame. And I and Gandhi won that too. But the one you won, that's incredible. Wow. What What is that award and who, who gives it to you and how did they give it to you? Oh, are you talking about the Ahimsa Award? Yeah. Uh, that's an award that's given, thank you, by the way. Uh, it's an award that's given by the Institute of Genealogy and Janeology, um, and it's it's presented in the House of Commons. And uh, yeah, that was just very, very, an incredible honor. It was given to, um, it was given to the Dalai Lama and Nelson Mandela. And um, it's it's for, uh, it was for my work on global nonviolence. So it was an incredible experience for me. And it was really lovely to have, you know, a recognition of animals, you know, as part of this converse, broader conversation about what it means to be nonviolent and in particular farmed animals. Do they give this award every year? Was there a ceremony? Yeah, there was. Um, and it was in the House of Commons in, in London. And I gave a, a speech and it is, I believe it's an annual award that they give. This was back in 2013. So going back a long way. Yeah. Well, I love the work you do because you're not just passionate about it, but you're, I mean, even the way you communicate is nonviolent because, you know, some vegans are what we call abolitionists and they communicate very differently than you. And I'm not sure that they have the same effect that you do, at least on people that aren't vegan. Yeah, well, um, thank you. And it's, I mean, abolitionist vegan is like referring to, you know, people's beliefs about, um, you know, what to advocate for you know, when you're advocating veganism and what kind of strategic approach to use when you're advocating veganism. Um, and I, it's less about communication. I mean, I think people can communicate effectively regardless of what they're advocating for. Um, what I've written about in more, my more recent books is, you know, how, how we can all work on our communication so that we increase the chances that our message is heard the way that we intend it to be. Because I'm sure you know this, you know, often all you have to do is say, I'm vegan. Vegan, and then this wall goes up, you know, and people are like, don't tell me that you'll ruin my meal. And, you know, and that's it. And this incredible resistance and defensiveness to your message, um, you know, goes up. And so really, for us, for those of us who really want to help raise awareness about this critical issue of veganism, you know, changing people's hearts and or opening people's hearts and minds. It's really important that we learn how to communicate in a way that helps people to be more receptive to our message and to communicate with each other as vegans. You know, there's like toxic communication is unfortunately epidemic in our movement. And, you know, I, in some ways we're cannibalizing ourselves through our own intermovement dynamics. Right. I, yeah. I, by the way, I just wanted to say, uh, I saw the talk you gave on Dr. McDougall's global climate climate change summit and oh. and that was fabulous by the way oh, that's very you. recent and it's if he just put it on youtube a couple of days ago if people missed that they can watch that but i know what you mean because sometimes i was a communications major in college but sometimes i don't communicate as effectively as i want to and sometimes it's not even on purpose like this pandemic where, where I live, we have to wear masks. And so I figured since I have to wear a mask, I want to wear a cute mask. And I have a mask that says vegan since 1977 real in really big letters. And 
a lot of people come up to talk to me because of the mask and, 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 and are interested, but then I could see for a lot of other people, it, it's, it's almost confrontational because mm-hmm. I think that sometimes people feel because I'm vegan, I am judging them for not being vegan. I, I don't even have to say anything, but just because I have a vegan shirt or button on, you know, they, they, uh, they, they're put on the defensive is what I mean. Yeah, I mean, in, in absolutely. And this is changing, fortunately. I remember when I first went vegan and it was, you know, when I stopped eating animals, it was like 1989 and the world was very different when it came to veganism back then. And it's changed dramatically. So there's much more uh, openness to our message, at least in many places in the world. Um, I've traveled, you know, I've been to over 50 countries and on six continents talking about veganism and about my work on carnism. And what I've seen is that awareness of veganism really is mushrooming all over the world. And the movement is at very different stages of its evolution in different places. So you have places like a lot of places in the U S you know, where you are, you're in LA still, right? I actually moved to the Palm Springs area two years ago. Oh, okay. Well, well, you're in California, right? So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of awareness of veganism. And so, you know, in the past, it was sort of like, you know, back in the eighties, anyway, people would look at me like I had two heads when I said I'm vegan. And now it's like, they'll say something like, oh, that's why you're so healthy. Or that's why you look like you're so young. I wish I could do that. I could never go vegan, but, um, so it's really changed quite a bit. And nevertheless, there is this automatic built-in defensiveness sometimes just to hearing that we're vegan, like, don't take away my freedom of choice or whatever other, you know, message they're worried they're going to get from us. Yeah. I, I, you know, when people aren't vegan, it, it seems like it's one of two reasons. Either they think they need animals, like they really can't live without them from a health standpoint, which, which is my favorite thing, because then we can, I don't want to say convince, but educate them, especially if they're willing to go to a plant-based doctor that no, there are ways to get enough protein and calcium and things like that. But then there's other people and these, see, cause I'm not, I wish I could be more like you and Colleen Patrick Rougeau, but I get really upset when people feel like it's like, it's their right to do that. And, and I understand like, if they think it's delicious, then we can help them. Be, that, that's where I come in. But when right. they feel like, like it's okay, it's okay. Like, it just drives me crazy when they feel like it's okay. I don't mind if they do it as long as they feel guilty about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're describing, I think, you know, the sense of entitlement, like, you know, people feeling entitled to eat animals because this is what they want to do. And I mean, and this is what I wrote about in, in why we love dogs, eat pigs and wear cows, which is really, which is the psychology of eating animals. You know, I wanted to write a book, not just about why, you know, people, shouldn't eat animals. We have a lot of information about that now, but rather why do people eat animals? Why do people eat animals in the first place? And, and I wanted to write this for non-vegans to help raise awareness, but also for vegans, because it's really hard when you're so frustrated, when, when you're looking at people who are in fact eating animals and thinking to yourself, and you have this story in your mind that this person is just a selfish, apathetic, individual who really doesn't care about animals, doesn't care about their impact and just wants to feel good. I mean, that's a hard way to go through the world that can make you, you know, incredibly frustrated, very misanthropic. It can make you, it can make anybody increasingly angry. And then we become less effective ambassadors for the cause. And, you know, we're not contributing to the kind of world we want to create. And when we understand carnism, um, which is the invisible belief system that conditions people to eat certain animals. It can really help us take a step back so that we can recognize eating animals as a problematic behavior that we absolutely want to change and do that without the emotional charge of anger and contempt and frustration and misanthropy. Um, that goes along with this story that we tell ourselves that these are just bad people who are doing bad things. And carnism is a, it's a system. It is a belief system that is dominant. That means it is so widespread and that it's invisible and it's just woven through the very structure of society. It shapes norms, laws, behaviors, beliefs, you know, and so on and so forth. And it becomes internalized. It shapes the very way people think and feel about eating animals. And this carnistic mentality 
is something that we are all born into. We're born into this system. We learn to look at the world through the eyes of this system. And the system of carnism is structured to cause people to feel defensive against anyone or anything that challenges what they believe is their right to eat animals. It basically causes people to resist the very information that would get them out of the box they don't even realize they're in. Yeah, but just because you can do something or even have the right legally doesn't mean it's a good idea or that you should. And, and I just, I, you know, I wanted to be vegan, but I, I became vegan when I was 17, the day I left home. My mom wouldn't let me. And now when I look back, I probably could have fought her harder. But basically, I ate as little animals as I could. And she always had to hide them in things. Like I couldn't eat anything with a bone, like like fish forgot, like no way, you know, with a head or anything mm -hmm. with a bone, like a rib or a chicken. But she made chili with some ground beef when I was little. Okay, I ate it because I, I didn't remind me so much of an animal. But it's, I, I just don't understand why people think it's okay. I never, even when I did it, I never thought it was okay. Like I thought, this is weird. This is gross. Why are we? And I was like, I, I had, there were no people like you around in the sixties or Neil Barnard or Miyoko Shinner or the internet. I just, it just felt like this is not normal. This is, and, and you know, what's kind of interesting is because we were raised Orthodox Jewish and the amount of animals that we ate were so much lim more limited compared to everybody else. So, so there were some laws in place that were ostensibly made for humane reasons. I mean, I don't believe that a kosher cow is killed any any better than a non-kosher cow, but, but some of the laws like not mixing milk with meat, don't cook a calf in her mother's milk. They, they may have come out of compassion. And of course we didn't eat any kind of pigs or shellfish. So I, I wasn't exposed to that many animals, but you know, I just, I don't, I don't know how we're ever going to change this belief that it's natural. It's normal. It's the, and I don't even get why people say it's delicious because unless you put sauce on it, it's not. Yeah. I, and, and your point is well taken. I mean, you, people are, people are really, really different. We are hardwired so differently from one another in some ways. I mean, our personalities are, are, you know, we, we tend to assume that we're all like re experiencing the world in a similar way, but we're not, we're introverted or we're extroverted. You know, some people are highly sensitive and very empathic and, and very reactive to any, you know, uh, any hint of suffering of themselves or others. And other people are much more desensitized or much less sensitive, I should say. You know, we're all very different. We come from very different backgrounds. We have very different levels of privilege very different levels of self-awareness and self-connection. We have different disgust responses. Some people are very easily disgusted. Um, other people, you know, they can witness things that are really gross and not be that moved by them or, or impacted by them. So there are a lot of factors that converge to make people more or less sensitive and responsive to this issue of eating animals. And we need more research to really understand um, you know, which people are more likely to make these connections that we're talking about and act on them. But we do have enough information to know now for those of us who are aware of the problem and really wanting to be a part of the solution, we have enough information to know um, how to do so as strategically as possible so that we really increase the chances that our message is heard the way that we intend it to be. And this is really, I think for any of us, uh, who considers ourself a, ourselves a vegan advocate, we really need to make a commitment to being as effective as possible because this is a cause that needs all the help it can get. And the good news is that the very practices that help increase our impact and our effectiveness for this cause, for this movement, are the same principles and tools that help us feel better in ourselves. Like we really need to work on ourselves so that we reduce the chances that we get emotionally hijacked, you know, that we move through our own lives with this feeling of like moral outrage and like simmering frustration and contempt because these emotions, although very understandable, we are, you know, we are living in the midst of what can only be called a global atrocity this atrocity that is carnism. It makes absolute sense that we feel morally outraged. It makes absolute sense that we feel so frustrated that we despair. 
we, you know, we, we are daily, our, our, some of our deepest sensibilities are offended on a daily basis. Of course, it's going to be a struggle for us. And nevertheless, we can't afford to allow ourselves to be consumed by these emotions. These are the emotions of trauma, basically. And, and many of us have experienced real trauma being awake to the atrocity that we're awake to. And so if we commit to working on ourselves, and I don't mean to put something else on vegans, very long to-do list, you know, here's some, something else to do now fix yourself. I don't mean it that way at all. But if we commit to doing the work that we need to, so that we can be healthier, more self-connected, grounded, peaceful, individuals with greater access to our compassion. That is one of the best things we can do for the animals and for the cause, because we are their ambassadors. And when we come to this with these understandable emotions, but when we come to our advocacy from this place of, of anger and contempt, we're much more likely to turn people off than to win supporters. Wow. You know, a lot of times I've heard you give the example of somebody eating a delicious meal, a beef a stew, a, a meat stew, and asking the host for the recipe. And they say, okay, write this down. You need, you know, it's the, the meat, you need golden retriever meat. And all of a sudden it's like, then they get disgusted. But I actually know people, not well, I was in a documentary in college called Point of View that eat dogs. They're from an Asian culture. And they, that they eat dogs and they actually have a pet dog too, which to me is even almost more bizarre. So how do we change the worldwide culture? Because, you know, think about it in, in Africa, they might eat termites. It could be a delicacy and most Americans probably wouldn't even want to try it. So, I mean, some, some cultures just look at all animals as food. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I don't think there's any culture that looks at all animals as food, but, but in meat eating cultures around the world, people have, you know, people learn to classify a certain animals as edible. And, you know, the types of animals that are classified as edible changes from culture to culture. So you're, that's true. In, in some places, people eat dogs in South Korea, for example, where uh, that was the first foreign language. Korean was the first foreign language that my book, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs and Wear Cows, was published in. And um, the book did very well in South Korea. Some people in South Korea eat dogs, but many people do not. And nobody eats all kinds of dogs. Certain types of dogs are for eating and other types of dogs are for pets. So it's the same. There's no difference in that mentality between that mentality and the mentality of people in the United States, for example, who go to a petting zoo and pet the piglets and then walk out of the supermarket next door with bags of bacon and you know ham. It's Carnism conditions us to put animals in compartments in our minds and categories in our minds. And we therefore harbor a very different set of feelings toward different types of animals and carry out very different types of behaviors toward them. So shifting the carnistic consciousness is no different in the United States than it is anywhere in Asia. Not to say that people, you know, don't eat different types of carnistic products they do, but the way that people relate to the carnistic products they eat is the same. So you can have somebody who raise, who, who slaughters pigs, but they've got a pet pig. And in their mind, that pet is different to them. It's the one that they've gotten, you know, close to and therefore given a name to, and therefore decided that they're not going to kill. So we need to shift this, this, the psychology in general, not, um, it's, it's just, it's no different from culture to culture in many ways. And for vegans who want to be effective, you know, really, our question, I think, is better served when we ask, uh, or, or the better, the, the more effective question for us to ask, I think, is who are the low hanging fruits? Social change doesn't happen when um, advocates reach out to the people who are the most resistant to their message. Social change happens when advocates reach those groups and individuals who are the closest to their message, who we, there are unfortunately over 8 billion people alive on the planet today. Many of them are not ready or willing to move toward veganism, but many of them are. 
and they're not as resistant. And so what we need to do is really, in my opinion, work on our messaging skills and our communication skills and build our relational literacy and then reach out to those people who are more likely to shift in our direction in this way, eventually the scales tip. When enough people move along, if you imagine a seesaw, enough people move along that seesaw, one side goes down. Right. There's so many questions, I don't know where to start and there's questions in the chat, but I mean, is this the kind of issue that we can baby step it? Because like, for example, abolitionists are all or nothing. And they're like, you know, like there's no such thing as humane meat. We shouldn't have bigger cages. But is are these little measures helpful when we vote for them so that people can start thinking of animals differently? Or is it just kind of like, you know, covering up really what the atrocity is? Um, I don't know what measures would be considered little measures. Um, I would say that you, I mean, so, so when you say a little measure, what are you referring to? Well, I remember it was a big deal where they were voting, at least in California, to increase the cage sizes. And, and people that were abolitionists say, don't do that because it just shows it's still okay. But the people that were for it were saying, at least let them be comfortable before they die. You know, mm -hmm. I, I hear people talking about both sides. Yeah, so to, to my knowledge, like, I don't know, I don't know that we have enough data to know when we're talking about, I mean, I don't have enough data, I should say, I know there are people who are working toward um, uh, institutional reform, who uh, have, who feel very strongly that that is an effective approach to work to move toward uh, more support for veganism, ultimately. It's not something that I can speak to because I don't feel that I'm informed enough to speak to that. What I can say is that um, when we are asking, you know, when we're talking about individual advocacy, and some people are, I think an example of what you're talking about is this question, should we ask people to take steps toward veganism, like to reduce their consumption of animals, or should we ask people just to go vegan? And either, you know, it's sort of one of these two asks. My recommendation is always to ask people to be as vegan as possible. When you ask somebody to be as vegan as possible, Basically, you are being that's the only respectful ask you can make of somebody because nobody can be more vegan than what's possible for them. And only the individual knows what's possible for them. So when you ask somebody and you say, you know, could you be as vegan as possible, then you give them the opportunity to decide what's most possible for them, you allow them to take these kind of smaller steps if they need to, but you make it clear that veganism is the ideal end, end goal. And frankly, if everyone in the world were as vegan as possible, the world would be vegan pretty soon. Absolutely. Do you think if you hadn't had that incident where you got violently ill from the burger that, that you might not be where you are today? Did that help push you towards this? Certainly helped push me towards it. I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't know. I think for a lot of people, becoming vegan is like a series of events that happen. Maybe some they don't even remember consciously, but that eventually lead up to, you know, making that final change. Right. So we have a, I have a couple of great questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, so Dr. Keeney says, can our environment and healthcare system handle small steps? It says it's harder to make big changes versus little changes. Yeah, I'm not quite sure um, when people are talking about small steps, what they're actually referring to. Um, I would say, I mean, we're talking about a, a huge issue here. We're talking about like institutionalized carnism. And, you know, this is, an, this is, this is, a speciesist attitude that has existed for millennia. And we're talking about multi-trillion dollar, you know, investment in maintaining this status quo. What this means is the problem is multifaceted. The problem is very old, very long-standing. And the problem is global. You know, it's a, it's, this is a global atrocity we're talking about. So we need to come at this problem from every possible angle. We really need to be focusing on institutional change, really getting institutions to, to work toward change. It, one person at a time is obviously not going to do that, do that um, or bring about change as quickly as possible. Um, 
We also need to make sure that we, we can advocate as effectively as possible because institutions are made up of people and they're influenced by people, by the public. So the more we can present our message to individuals and to institutions effectively, the more quickly change will come. So I, I don't really understand the question of like small steps versus large steps. Um, you know, we take many steps and we take whatever steps we can make can take. And I think the most important question for us to be asking ourselves is what, what steps are effective? What is an effective strategic approach? And through our or my organization, Beyond Carnism, we run the Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy. For people who are interested, they can come to carnism.org or go to veganadvocacy.org. We have a lot of information. We provide trainings um, online. We're, we're developing online courses now for anybody who wants to improve their ability to advocate effectively and also to make strategic decisions. Thank you. Jay says, I'm a big fan of you both. What is the most effective way to educate someone on the horrors of the meat and dairy industry without coming off as preachy? And a similar question from Dr. Keeney, what is the best way to educate, persuade, and inform? Because a lot of people I hear, they just would rather not know. Um, Yes, as I said, you know, carnism causes people to, to resist our message. Um, and when we make it clear, first of all, you know, it, it, first of all, reaching people and encouraging people to open their hearts and minds to our message requires that we have an attitude that allows those people to feel safe hearing our message. So if you're coming to, with your, if you're bringing your message out to the public, out to other individuals, and you actually believe that that person is a bad person for eating animals or that you are somehow morally superior to them because you don't eat animals, the chances of them being receptive to your message are significantly lower than if you really honored their dignity in your approach. And that what by that I mean, did not perceive them in any way as less than or inferior to you or anyone else morally. And so, so change needs to happen if, or, or I, I would say the stage needs to be set first in, in our attitudes um, coming forth, coming forward with this. When it comes to presenting the message itself, like behaviorally, um, showing and communicating about why this matters to the person you're talking to is obviously important. Really understanding what, what matters to them. So if I'm advocating veganism or if I'm talking about veganism to someone, I'm gonna tailor my message to what matters to them. So if they're really interested in the environment, you know, I will talk about more about the environmental ramifications. If they're interested in health, I'll talk about my own experience getting, you know, with health and being vegan. I always share the information through my own story. Nobody can make your story wrong. So if somebody says to you, why are you vegan? You, you can really answer that. Instead of saying, you know, all the reasons why they should be vegan, you can really answer that question by saying why you are vegan and asking them to witness and look at the situation through your eyes. And to the first um, question, you know, how do we share information about animal suffering? I think it was something like that. Um, when people want to turn away from that, we need to be very, very careful with that. It's important that people become aware of the truth. There's no question. At the same time, it's also important that they hear the truth in a way that increases the chances that they can take it in and not turn you, the deliverer of that truth, the bearer of that information into the enemy. What this means is that if you want to share graphic imagery with somebody, um, you get their permission to do that first. And even if you're posting a video online, for example, have a warning, have a trigger warning on it. Otherwise, when you shock people into witnessing trauma, you can traumatize them. And this is a form of emotional violence. They will quite likely perceive you as the perpetrator because you've perpetrated this violence on them, this violence of witnessing on them. And they will also more likely shut down to your message rather than be receptive to it. And it doesn't take much violence, you know, for people to understand just how violent the system is. We don't need to bang people over the head and show them like hours of it. It like 30 seconds a minute is, is, 
probably plenty for many people. And sometimes we don't even need to show this at all. You know, it might be better sometimes to show images of sad farmed animals rather than bloody farmed animals. There's just, there's new research that I believe is being conducted really looking at trying to answer this question. It's also important that when you share distressing information or distressing imagery, that's not all you share. Like we tend as vegans, because we're so aware of the problem and how serious it is, we tend to over-focus on the problem. And it's like, we're talking about the environment and the animals and our health and all that's wrong and all the horrors of carnism. And people can only take in so much of this kind of information without feeling despair, which is a sense of hopelessness. And like, well, what's the point? And I'm only one person anyway. So it's really important to make sure that when you're communicating, you also focus on the positive, you know, a couple of things that are problematic. And, and now that I've become vegan, I feel so much healthier. That's really exciting. I feel, I feel really good about myself with my food choices. And, I, and that's really exciting. I cook in really creative ways now, and that's really exciting. Nice. Thank you. So guys, I've been posting the link. This book is now in its 10th anniversary edition. And so if you haven't read this, read all of Dr. Joy's books, but especially I think this one is just a, a great one on the subject. My favorite chapter is the one that goes, I think it said from from ap apathy to empathy. That's, that's, I love that because that, that's just, I don't know, that's brilliant. So do you Thank think you. that the fact that meat and dairy is subsidized is gonna make it more difficult? Because I, I recently had Amy Hamlin on the show. She does the New York School Coalition. And she was saying, it's like, they are required in the public school system to offer milk. Like, it, it, like, they, like kids can have water, but they gotta offer the milk or the chocolate milk. It's like, it's like a thing in, in in our government. It's, it's crazy. And a lot of kids are allergic to milk or lactose intolerant. Yeah. Uh, subsidies are a huge problem, clearly a huge problem. And this is why it's so important for us to work on legislative change. And, you know, I'm talking about advocacy here, which is how you're communicating, you know, when you're talking with people, um, you're not forcing change, but you're encouraging people to think differently and hopefully to vote for change when they have the opportunity to. Legislation is essentially forcing change, but we can only get legislation passed when enough people really understand and support the work that we're trying to do. Great. Diane, who's watching live says, how do we resolve the economic issue of eliminating animal farming and processing? We change the farms to other types of crops like mushrooms. I mean, there are a lot of people who can speak to this much more effectively and eloquently than I can, because I'm a psychologist and not an economist, but I know, um, you know, this question has been examined and this was a, a similar question came up when there were pretty strong lobbies to end tobacco farming, um, you know, and they found ways to, or, or growing tobacco, you know, when there were lobbies against the tobacco industry. So, um, and, and legislation getting passed. So, you know, this question has come up before when problematic industries have been asked to change their practices. And you can even see it now with like um, uh, meat companies or animal agribusinesses, carnistic industry, I should say, you know, that's, that's shifting production to starting, you know, plant-based production. Great. So tell us about your newer books, like Getting Relationships Right. What made you decide to write a book on that? Well, Getting Relationships Right, um, I wrote on the heels of my book, Beyond Beliefs, which is a guide to improving um, communication and relationships for vegans, vegetarians, and meat eaters. And, you know, I, that book is, you know, written specifically for people navigating this ideological difference and, and also for vegans relating to other vegans because veganism impacts the way that we understand and relate to ourselves and others in some fairly significant ways. Um, I wanted to write a version of Beyond Beliefs that was not just for people in, you know, who, who are vegan, essentially. And Getting Relationships Right is um, written as a one-stop guide to building what I call relational literacy, which is the understanding of an ability to practice healthy ways of relating. And I, you know, I have, 
I always say that it really astounds me that most of us have to learn complicated geometry that we'll probably never need to use, and yet we don't get a single formal lesson in how to be healthy relational beings, which includes how to communicate effectively. And when you think of some of the most pressing problems, you know, not only in our personal lives, but also in the world, like, um, you know, war and poverty and genocide, carnism, sexism, racism, environmental destruction, animal exploitation, and so on and so forth. These are not problems that are caused by people who don't know how to do geometry. Um, when you look at these, some of these major problems in the world and, and also some of the ones in our personal lives, you can see that these problems all have a common denominator and that common denominator is relational dysfunction. That's dysfunctional ways of relating to other individuals, between social groups, to other animals, to the environment, and even to ourselves. And so the good news is that when we build relational literacy, we don't only improve our own lives, but we also improve our movement, our organizations, our communities, and our world. I mean, I really believe that if we weren't living in, like still living in the relational dark ages, like if our collective level of relational literacy were not so low, we wouldn't elect toxic leaders, you know? And, and for our movement in particular, for vegans, um, you know, when we think about it, it, when we look at our movement, I feel incredible inspiration and incredible gratitude for the work that we're doing and for the, the commitment and the courage of the people in this movement. And I feel a lot of concern for the suffering of the people in this movement that is due to the relational dysfunction and the toxic communication and ways that we're, we're harming each other simply because we're relating in ways that are so, are so problematic. And, and we're all just doing the best that we can with the tools that we have. But I wanted a book that would really provide, you know, a one-stop guide to the principles and tools for doing it, for doing it differently, for relating in a way that's healthy so we can build resilient relationships and a resilient movement. Okay, can you teach us that? What is this relational <laughs> literacy? And, and you talk about the relational immune system because I remember when I was in my late twenties, I was the, uh, the executive secretary of, a, of an animal rights group called the National Stop Pound Seizure Coalition. And it was headed by Midge Costanza. She was doc, uh, one of the first women ever in cabinet. She worked for uh, Jimmy Carter. And the idea was, is look, we're not gonna stop the animal shelters for euthanizing dogs. We, we don't, I mean, we'd like to, but since we can't, what we'd like to at least stop doing is have it so that if somebody had a pet for 10 years, that dog cannot be used in animal research. That's not right. That's not fair. And we actually got that passed. So I was able to go to this national conference. Right. It was in San Francisco and almost every animal rights organization at the time, there was probably the 2000s was in the room and all they did was fight. And even today, you know, you have the people that are vegan for health, vegan for animals, vegan for the planet. And I'm not saying all they do is fight, but they'll, you know, you'll hear things like, well, if you're not vegan for the animals, you shouldn't be vegan. And I'm like, I don't think the cow cares why he's not being killed personally. So it, it, it's kind of like, I feel like, can't we all just get, it's like vegans can't even seem to get along. Yeah, so this is why, I mean, people, people struggle with relationships. And when I'm talking about relationships, you know, it, I'm not just talking about intimate relationships. I'm talking about all kinds of relationships, you know, it, brief encounters, you know, just interactions. Um, and, you know, none of us, as I said, have really gotten any, for, almost none of us has really gotten any formal training in how to do it right, how to get relationships right. And in fact, most of what we've learned has been problematic. You know, for, for most of us, we haven't had the best role models. You know, if our parents didn't screw us up, then our teachers did. And if our teachers didn't screw us up, Hollywood sure did. I mean, so we do the best we can with what we have. Um, and unfortunately, um, for many, many of us are really struggle. And when we throw veganism into the mix, you know, as I said earlier, many vegans have experienced trauma. It take, you know, we live under a tremendous amount of pressure in this dominant, dominant animal eating world. And so uh, the good news is that with relational literacy, it's, this is, you know, a set of principles and tools that can be learned by anybody who really wants to learn them. So this is not rocket science. And that's, 
exactly why I wrote my book. Um, and we're developing trainings on this through our Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy as well. But to just to boil it down, like the formula for healthy relating, right? If you want just kind of like the bare bones formula, this is a formula that you can apply. I call it the formula for healthy relating. It applies to all kinds of relationships, regardless of their expression. So, you know, it could be a communication or a nonverbal behavior. Communication is the primary way we relate. Um, this formula applies regardless of the duration of the relationship. It applies to a brief interchange, to a long-term partnership. Um, it applies to how we relate to other animals and how we relate to ourselves. We're always relating to ourselves. And most of us do not relate to ourselves in a way that's healthy and compassionate. And the formula is this. Um, a healthy relationship or relational interaction is one that reflects integrity honors dignity and leads to a greater sense of connection and security. And I'm gonna break this down for you. So when you're interacting with somebody and you wanna know if this is a healthy interaction, ask yourself, does this interaction reflect integrity and does it honor dignity? Now, if it reflects integrity, integrity is the integration of values and practices, the two most important of which are compassion or caring and justice. So when you practice integrity, that means you are being compassionate and fair to the other person or toward yourself. To really simplify it, that means you're treating that other person the way you would want to be treated if you were in their position. That's practicing integrity. When you honor dignity, this means that you perceive this person as having inherent worth, that you do not see them as inferior or less worthy than you or anybody else of being treated with respect, regardless as to who they are or what they have done. So you practice integrity and you honor dignity. And when you do these two things, it leads to a greater sense of connection and a greater sense of security. And this, of course, exists on the spectrum, right? You can have a relationship, you know, or an interaction that like completely, you know, reflects this really strongly or, you know, it, 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 can, it can be practiced to a greater or lesser degree. It's not like you practice integrity or you don't. It's how much integrity do you practice? How connected do you end up feeling? And so you can pause in any, at any moment during any interaction, you can just pause and ask yourself, do I feel like this other individual is practicing integrity toward me? Are they honoring my dignity? Do I feel connected? Do I feel secure? Am I practicing integrity? Am I honoring dignity? You know, these are the questions to, to ask yourself. Easier said than done, but with practice, um, it gets easier. And of course, the rest of my book is how to do this, right? But just really specific tools for conflict resolution and effective communication and so on and so forth. But this is really the core formula. You know, for those of us that don't, that reading isn't our favorite thing, do you offer workshops? Because I think like an interactive workshop, this would be really wonderful to learn this skill because you talk about how being, try to be as vegan as possible. Maybe we should just try to be as have as much integrity as possible. Exactly. It's so well said. That is so well said. And exactly this expect ex exists on the spectrum. And it's also important to, you know, practice integrity toward yourself and compassion toward yourself and not to be like morally perfectionistic about this and beat yourself up and say, oh my God, I'm not, I'm not acting with enough integrity because then you're not practicing integrity to your, towards yourself. So yeah, the book is in audio and we are developing uh, workshops uh, on relational literacy. That's fantastic. So here's a, an interesting question from Angela, who's watching live. And I've heard this before from parents. Is it correct to lie to children about where their hamburger or chicken nuggets came from? I mean, I don't know if correct is a word that I would feel comfortable using or, or not using. Um, I, I, it really depends. I mean, in general, I mean, I wouldn't, it's a very good question. I don't think lying is um, obviously a healthy practice toward anybody, children or not. And you know, if there's if there's a reason 
if there's a reason that a child cannot be made aware of the reality of a situation, I don't know, maybe their parents are going to have, you know, a very strong reaction to you telling the ch their children something. Um, there, I would recommend finding another way to communicate about it rather than lying. I don't want to talk about this right now. It's not my place to talk about this. Talk to your, maybe your mom and dad will want to talk to you about this, but I'm not your parents. Um, I, I don't know, but I would, I don't advocate lying in general. The age of a child matters. The, the, the reasoning behind sharing information matters. There are some great children's books out now on how to talk to animal, uh, children about, about veganism and about farmed animals that, um, could be really helpful, you know, if you are the parent and you're wondering about how to communicate with your children about the issue. Well, I think also how you tell them is important. I remember when I had Dr. Uh, I always call her doctor. She's not a doctor, but she's like a doctor, Brenda Davis on. She was saying the first time that uh, her, her son was at a birthday party at McDonald's. And it's the first time he knew that hamburgers were made out of cows and he started crying. So I think, you know, I think like you say, it's just, just whether they tell them whether or not Santa Claus is real. So that, that's an interesting question though. Why do you think relational literacy is so crucial to the success of the vegan movement? Well, a movement is only as successful as its proponents in many ways. And obviously there are a lot of components to, to, to movements, but advocates are a huge part of a movement. And Advocacy is communicating, when we're talking about vegan advocacy, we're talking about communicating about veganism. We are spokespeople for this cause. Vegans are running organizations. They're starting, you know, they're running organizations, they're running companies, they're blogging. There are many vegans in, in positions of influence and we're all ambassadors for the cause. Communication, as I said, is the primary way we relate. When we're more relationally literate, this means we have learned how to communicate more effectively. And the more effectively we can communicate, the more likely it is that people will hear our message the way that we want them to hear it and not get defensive against the message. We also reduce the level of, of infighting um, and relational dysfunction within our own movement so we can more effectively problem solve and strategize together. So instead of fighting each other about which strategy is more effective, we can dialogue with each other and deepen and broaden our understanding and determine which strategies are in fact more effective. Um, our organizations will run more effectively when we have more relationally literate leaders who are at lower risk of abusing their, their leadership uh, and relationally literate teams that are less likely to engage in, in relationally dysfunctional behaviors, which can really take an organization down. And on top of it, for many of us, um, you know, we become vegan and find that our relationships and communication start breaking down with the people in our lives who are not vegan. And, you know, that is, I don't know about you, um, but I, I have heard from many, many vegans that, you know, they just feel that this relationship and communication breakdown is siphoning off a tremendous amount of energy from them. Like they're spending so much time trying to navigate their relationships with family and friends who are not vegan, that they don't have a, le a lot left over to give to the movement. Um, so when you become more relationally literate, your own personal um, relationships can really benefit. And frankly, at the end of the day, we're, what we're really advocating is relational literacy when we're advocating veganism. It's a form of relational literacy. We're advocating that people change the way that they relate to those animals they've learned to classify as edible, to farmed animals, so that they relate to them in a healthy way rather than a dysfunctional way. Great, thank you. What is this relational immune system that you have written about? Um, in, in my book, I, I talk about how relationships are like, um, like bodies in many ways. They get sick when their immune system is weaker than the germs that challenge them. Like, so your body gets sick. I mean, this is obviously an oversimplification, but you get the idea. Your body gets sick when its immune system is weaker than the germs you're exposed to. Your relationship gets sick when your relational immune system is weaker than the, not the germs, but the stressors that it's exposed to. Your relationships are always being exposed to stressors like the loss of a job or an illness or um, a difference of ideology, for example. A strong relational immune system is resilient it's resilient and it's strong or resilient when it is both secure and connected. 
So the more secure and connected you feel with somebody, the more resilient your relationship is, the better able you are to withstand the stressors that you experience. And the way you keep your relational uh, immune system strong or you stay resilient is by practicing this formula that I talked about, honoring, uh, uh, practicing integrity and honoring dignity. And this leads to security and connection. Wow. You know what, I, I don't know, I just had this, I, it's a bizarre idea, but you know, you know how like kids sometimes collect baseball cards. What if every piece of slaughtered animal in the store came with the photo of the animal being slaughtered? Do you think people would buy it? <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, I don't know. Today, maybe not, but people might get desensitized to it. Humans have a rem remarkable capacity to desensitize themselves. Um, in the past and in some places in the world, people are up close and personal with the animals that they kill and consume. Maybe not personal, but certainly up close. Um, people learn to desensitize themselves. But from what I've heard, and I've been trying to get someone on the show that, that works in a slaughterhouse, that they have very, uh, they do these jobs, not because they want to, or they aspire to, but that's like, maybe they, they don't speak English and this is all they can get. And they, they are traumatized. So it's, it's not like they love going to work every day. That's right. Oh, that's right. I mean, most people who actually have to do like are in the slaughter business, you know, are in that business. They're not, you know, it's, it's, they're not in that business because they're trying to make money um, or lots of money, I should say, with the slaughterhouse workers, you know, they're doing it because they have no choice. And, and many of them are, in fact, immigrants, um, you know, not non-native speaking, uh, uh, non-native English speaking immigrants or non-English speaking immigrants in the U.S. anyway. In Europe, it's a similar situation. And, and they're exploited, you know, they're they're exploited as part of this, you know, the carnistic ex exploitation that we've been talking about. Right. Well, this is just a fun, it's a personal question, but it's not too personal from our mutual friend, Linda Middlesworth. She wants to know if now that you've lived in Germany for, I believe, at least 10 years, do you speak German and do you miss the United States at all? Oh, hi, Linda. I miss you, Linda. <laughs> um, so I've been here for about seven years, actually, and uh, my German is, let's say it's, it's intermediate. Um, so it's a hard language. I sound, I call it Kinderdeutsch, which is child German. So let's just say I couldn't have an interview like this in German, um, but I can certainly run errands. And I do miss, I miss not so much the United States as the people in the United States. Um, I miss the, the people there a lot, um, which is why I'm so looking forward to coming back after travel restrictions are lifted and it's actually safe to travel again. Right. So would you talk about your other books too? Like if somebody's just seeing you for the first time, where should they start? Because I, you have other books too. You have Powerarchy, you have Beyond Belief, you have mm -hmm. one I have, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs and Wear Cows. What a great title. And of course, the one we were talking about, uh, relation, uh, Getting Relationships Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, they're they're sort of spokes on a wheel in a sense. Um, it uh, people can start anywhere they want. I mean, if somebody is already vegan, they can certainly read um, "Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows" um, because it talks about the psychology of carnism, the psychology of, of not being vegan, and that can be very helpful. Um, if they want support around relationships and communication, either of the two books that I mentioned earlier, "Beyond Beliefs" or "Getting Relationships Right." Um, depending on whether they want to focus more on vegan, non-vegan relationships or, or relational literacy in general. Um, Powerarchy is on the psychology of oppression. And what I wrote about in Powerarchy is, is more of an expansion of my theory uh, of carnism and um, how oppression, basically I, I talk about how oppression is a reflection of relational dysfunction and it also creates relational dysfunction. So really understanding oppression through a relational lens and seeing how different oppressions are interconnected um, through this relational and psycholo psychological lens. And then my, my most recent book is called The Vegan Matrix. And this is a book about uh, understanding privilege, why it's important for vegans to understand 
privileges other than just human privilege. Um, so male privilege, white privilege, class privilege, and so on and so forth, and how to understand what privilege is. It's really an introduction to, you know, what is privilege? And if you're a vegan, um, this is a form of privilege that you probably understand, but these are forms of privilege you may not understand. So it's really sort of an introduction to what privilege looks like outside of human privilege, and also a, a guide to how to talk about the issue without getting stuck in arguments about it. Nice. You have this concept that I find really fascinating, and I think it's probably a good idea, even though I've never probably done it, because I'm sort of like, an, you know, Aries, just like, just go vegan, but it's about creating vegan allies. I love that. Oh, thank you. Um, a vegan ally is the term I use for a person who is not fully vegan yet themselves, but who is a supporter of veganism and vegans. And we, you know, as vegans, we tend to assume understandably, um, yet in my opinion, in, inaccurately, um, that either you're vegan and you're part of the solution or you're not vegan and you're part of the problem. And, you know, what this does is it prevents like 99% of the population from supporting a cause that really needs all the help it can get. People, do not become fully vegan or even vegan um, for a lot of different reasons that are relevant to them. And yet they may nevertheless want to support the cause. And so vegan allies support the cause in other ways. There are people, some of the people I know who have done the most to support this cause are not vegan. Um, and I'm talking about impact here. I think it's so important for us as vegans to really be thinking about impact you know, what is the best for the animals? What is the best thing for this cause? So journalists, for example, who interview me and publish articles about carnism and veganism that reach hundreds of thousands, sometimes more people who are not vegan, that journalist who's done that, one of those journalists might spare more animals' lives than a vegan does simply by not eating animals throughout their entire lifetime. You know, so we really want to invite people in to use their influence however they can to support this cause, whether it's, you know, donations. Some of the people who donate to Beyond Carnism, my organization, we're entirely dependent on don donations. They, some of them are not vegan, not even vegetarian, but they help fund us so that we can do the work that we're doing in the world. So invite the people in your life to be vegan allies. I think that's really important. Um, you know, for many vegans who struggle in relationships, it's you, you may find that that struggle ends when the other person doesn't become vegan, but becomes a vegan ally, an ally to you who supports you and who gets you and who has your back. I love that idea. What about the people that are really anti-vegan? I don't want to give them any credence or say their names, but there are whole YouTube channels and blogs that are devoted to really saying really mean, I mean, I've been the, on the attack, a lot of, you know, Dr. Gregor, Dr. Barnard, like how, how do we, how do we have the, the kind of communication you're talking about when somebody is basically lying and, you know, saying mean things about us and uh, Photoshopping our photos to make us look sick and things like that. Do we just ignore it? Is that the best tactic? Well, whenever possible, take legal action for sure, because that's not legal. Um, so there, you know, you can certainly do things, but I would not engage with them the way that they're engaging because it's inviting more toxicity. Um, you know, just, I would encourage not feeding the behavior by not engaging with it, except to engage in a way that increases the chances that it's going to basically force them to stop doing what they're doing, which is illegal. And beyond that, not to engage because we, like I said, we really need to go for the low hanging fruits. There are people who are just, um, you know, they're, they're never going to change and they're not the people that we need to be reaching. Yeah. For people that are not yet vegan or even considering it, what do you think their biggest obstacle is? Is it, do you feel like they feel they need meat to survive? They can't get vegetables or they just really like the taste of flesh? I mean, people are all very, very different. Um, and it, there's no one size fits all S for some people. It really is just like, uh, not, I don't want to say just, but, but they actually believe in veganism and they're afraid to become vegan, um, because they're afraid that they're going to lose important connections with their family and friends, because they know that the people in their community will not be receptive to and supportive of this change. 
Yeah, that's, are there places though really where they, they need me to survive? Are there certain countries, because I'm not really versed in the world. I see fourth grade, I never had geography, but other places for where, where <laughs> veganism is not really possible for people. Just because. Well, yeah, there are, I mean, there are, of course, people who are economically unable to make their food choices freely, they, then they, they don't have the option of being vegan. And, and this is really important for vegans to take in. Like we, to be able to make your food choices freely is a privilege that many people in the world do not have. And, you know, the people who do have that privilege are the ones who have the greatest impact, who are consuming the most amount of animals in the first place. So really be very careful and focus on the people who are receptive and are in a position to actually make the change that you want them to make. Okay. So what, what, what should we do, Dr. Joy? What's the first step? How can we help you and support your work? What, what, how can we c communicate better and, and get more vegan allies and, and what, what, how can we well, be thank better? You. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Well, I mean, my organization Beyond Carnism and our program Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy, we exist to support this change and to support the people who are working toward creating a better world for all beings. Like we are, that is our goal is to support you guys. And um, please come to carnism.org. We have so many resources that are like easy to share videos for non-vegans that, um, you know, we've designed to reduce the chances that they'll be defensive Against. We have a lot of materials for vegans or veg curious people who want to improve their relationships, their communication, their advocacy, you know, their support for the cause. And of course, as I said before, if anybody, we're, we're a charitable organization, totally dependent on donations. So if anybody wants to support us, um, you know, that's obviously a huge help to us as well. Well, thank you so much. I'll make sure we put that in, in, the, in the show notes. And if you ever do decide to teach interactive Zoom classes or, or on relational literacy, I promise I'll promote it and I'll be the first <laughs> one to sign up. Thank you. We, well, we are, we're putting them together and we'll absolutely let you know. So Please do because I mean that very sincerely, because I know that I, I mean, I do some good in the world, but I can do better and I can learn to control my mouth a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> we all can, we all can, but, but thank you. You're doing, you're doing great work. You're reaching so many people and just, I hear about you here in Europe, you know, and I hear people Aww. know you, they know your show and I'm like, oh my God. It's oh, just that's fantastic. great to see you getting out here. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've learned to control my mouth as far as what I put in, but not so much about what I <laughs> put out. So I really do appreciate the way you do. Oh, we just got a nice super chat donation from Vegan Trucker Lady. And guys, if you're in the mood for donations, how about to Dr. Oh. Drew's organization? That might be something nice as well. Thank you so much, Vegan Trucker Lady. And it's been so great catching up with you. It's been far too long, but I mean it sincerely. When that class is ready, that would be something that we could get a lot of people to take, I'm sure. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks well, for the great work you're doing. Well, my pleasure. And thank you for your work. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we have a double header. In the morning, we have Tabay Atkins. He is the youngest certified yoga teacher in the world. He's, I believe, 15 years old. And he's going to be making a vegan Taco Bell crunch taco. And at 2 p.m., we have Dr. Colin Campbell talking about his new book. Thanks so much, Dr. Joy. Take Same. care. Thanks so Bye -bye. much.